Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Virtual Summer Camp uh, through OSA, Open Space Authority. Uh, my name is Anna, and I am with WERC, the Wildlife Education and Rehabilitation Center. WRC, the Wildlife Center, uh, we're a wildlife rehab um, a facility, so we take in wild animals, uh, specifically birds of prey and bobcats, those are our two specialties, uh, to fix them up to get them back out into the wild. And right now we're here at beautiful Coyote Valley, um, which is a perfect habitat for a variety of wildlife. Uh, if you guys come out here, go on uh, beautiful hikes, check out the scenery, uh, the more you keep your eyes and ears open, the more wildlife you are going to see. Today though, I'm gonna share animals with you guys that might be a little bit more difficult to see uh, when you're out during the daytime, because these guys are nocturnal animals. So they come out at night when you guys are sleeping. And I'm just gonna rephrase it because I don't know if you guys heard it, but these guys could also not only be found here, but also in your own backyards. These are local nocturnal animals. So again, at night, if you go out, keep your ears and eyes open and I'll tell you how to spot these guys. All right, it is a little windy out here as you guys can see my hair flying around. Um, so I'm going to get these animals out, just giving the heads up. They might flop around a little bit, trying to adjust for the wind. Um, I'm gonna try to block them as best I can with my body block the wind. Um, but I just wanted to give you a heads up if you guys see a little struggling. If you guys do have questions, you are welcome to type them in. Um, Terry's going to read them off for me uh, when those questions come up. I'll probably be able to get to more of the questions after I put the animal away because I might cover a question that you might have uh, before we even get there, if that makes any sense. All right, let's get our first nocturnal animal out. Her name is Olivia. Might give you a guess what Olivia might be. And I have a feeling we might lose some covers on, we, on their kennels, <laughs> but that's okay. Gets exercise. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I don't don't think it's gonna pick up on the mic very that well, but you guys might hear a noise. All right, let's see. Hopefully, I'm in camera frame. <laughs> This is Olivia, and Olivia is a western screech owl. Now, the name screech owl is very misleading. She actually does not screech. So if you guys happen to be outside at night and hear you hear kind of like a cooing, kind of a kind of sound, it's more than likely coming from a screech owl. Now, I'm not perfect at making that sound. That's the best I can do. Um, oh. Terry does it much better. So, oh, you're not mic'd. <laughs> ah, hopefully you guys can hear her over me uh, talking. There she goes again. Uh, they do make different vocalizations. Uh, they do can sound like trilly, kind of like a bouncy ball. Um, so again, keep your ears open when you come out at night because these guys can be quite difficult to see because of how small they are. This is as big as she gets. A lot of people see her and feel, think that she's just a baby owl but owls come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, she is not even the smallest owl we have here in Santa Clara County. The smallest owl we have here is actually the Northern Pygmy Owl, which is a little bit smaller and is um, a cousin to her, but a big difference is she's nocturnal. Northern Pygmy Owls are actually diurnal, which means they come out during the daytime. So not all owls are nocturnal. Now, the reason why we have Olivia, and she's not out in the wild where she belongs, because remember, that's our primary goal, because we believe all animals deserve to be wild and free. Um, but unfortunately, Olivia here, even though they are native, she was found up in Oregon on the side of the road. So we can kind of make assumptions. She can't tell us exactly what happened. But more than likely, she could have been struck by a car. Uh, luckily, probably just grazed, um, but she's found on the ground unable to fly. She went into a wildlife center up in Oregon. They took a look at her and they noticed she had a wing injury. Um, so if you look at her, you might notice, I mean, I was like, I can kind of walk up there. You might notice one wing looks a little different than the other. Also when she kind of kind of uh, stumbled on my hand right there. Oh, there goes, she's molting. There goes a feather. I don't know if you <laughs> cut that. Um, you might've seen that one ring on the left side didn't really extend out. She didn't really move it. That's because she's actually paralyzed in that wing. She can't feel it. So she got nerve damage, possibly again from a collision from a car. 
Um, it's almost like if you fall asleep funny on your arm, it gets all tingly and then you try to pick it up over your head and you whack yourself with it. I don't know if I'm the only one who's ever done that. <laughs> um, but you know, you can't control that arm. So if you can imagine, she couldn't feel that wing, she wouldn't be able to fly. And it's very important for her to be able to fly because one, she's a small bird of prey. So that means she's prey herself. So other animals would be able to catch her very easily. Also being she's a bird of prey, that means she eats meat. She, has to, she goes and catches other animals. She couldn't fly, she would never be able to hunt, so she would actually starve. So that's why we do have her. Um, so she stays at the wildlife center. And being that she can't fly, she does have to have a special type of enclosure because um, we want to give them the, the biggest, bestest enclosure that we can. Again, it's not going to replicate the wild like we would love. You know, we can't just let her out here and have her um, safely come back for, for programs or safely live out in the wild without getting eaten. Um, so we have to make our enclosures adapted to um, their, their, uh, their disability, basically. Um, so birds like to be up high. Okay, they don't like to be down on the ground, most birds. There are some birds that live on the ground, uh, quail, um, and uh, killdeer tend to be on the ground. <laughs> but she prefers to be up in trees. So instead of just having um, a really tall enclosure that she could easily just fall and not be able to catch herself because she couldn't fly, uh, we actually have to have her enclosure raised off the ground up nice and high to make her feel comfortable, but nice and long. Um, so again, we try to accommodate for these guys. Now. Even though she is small, she does eat a wide variety of food and a lot more surprising things than you probably think. Probably the first thing that comes to mind when you think of an owl and what food they eat is probably mice. Yes, Olivia here, she does love to eat, her, uh, eat a mouse. Um, but in the wild, these guys do have such a wide variety of prey. Not only do they eat mice, they can actually even eat rats too, even though these guys are small, um, but they'll eat a lot of insects. Um, these guys will also even eat, what I find fascinating, is these guys will actually eat fish. Now, that doesn't mean she's going swimming in the lakes and the rivers and stuff to catch big, huge trout. Um, she, she, she's not made for the water, but she'll use these sharp little talons to scoop those tiny little minnows, those little uh, silver fish, right off the surface of the water, and she'll actually eat them. Um, so being that we have these birds in the area, these guys help us out a lot. Predators are so important because she helps control that uh, prey really, um, the prey number so they don't get overpopulated. Um, I know it sounds like it would be a great utopia to have a world where nothing ate anything else, but the reality is, is that would actually be very devastating because if there wasn't something to eat something else, they'd get overpopulated. If they get overpopulated, it causes problems for the environment because there's not enough resources. So the resources would dwindle really quickly. And being there's not enough resources uh, for these animals to eat, a lot of them are going to starve. There's also not gonna be enough habitat for these guys to live in. So they're gonna be crammed together in tight quarters. When you're crammed together, you are gonna spread disease a lot quicker. And I'm sure you guys are all familiar with disease spread right now uh, with the whole COVID going on. Um, so again, that's why distancing, um, even for wild animals, is important to help, again, stop the spread of disease. So again, that's where these predators help in controlling those animals. She's singing a lot. She is, she's very talkative, and the wind's actually dying down. Woohoo! You gonna know, talk like a little bouncy ball? Now, uh, what you might notice, so when you're out in areas such as Coyote uh, Valley um, Open Space Preserve, when you're hiking up in the hills here, this is a perfect habitat for western screech owls. But again, when you're out during the day, you might not see them because she is going to use that, those feathers to camouflage really well in with trees. So every time you pass an oak tree, take a really close look at it, you might see a little bump sitting up there and it could possibly be a western screech owl. Not only will these guys roost up in trees, but they will also take over woodpecker holes. Okay, so it makes a nice cavity for these guys to um, stay out of the elements, get some protection, uh, stay away from predators. So there are actually quite a few acorn woodpeckers I've heard um, around here at Coyote Valley. So again, perfect place for these screech owls to kind of make home. Um, but again, those feathers are gonna help camouflage her in really well. You also might notice she has quite big eyes. Okay? Now she, her those eyes help her see very well at nighttime. 
However, we're out during the daytime. Some people think if owls are out during the daytime, they can't see very well. They just get blinded by how much light's around them. They actually can see just as well as you guys can during the daytime, but they see a lot better at nighttime because of the size of her eyes. Now, she's a small bird, but her eyes are huge compared to the size of her body. Very large. In fact, if I took all her feathers off, which of course I would never do that. We're not going to take your feathers off. Don't worry, Olivia. <laughs> but if she had no feathers on her, she'd pretty much just be eyeballs and a beak. Okay? Those eyeballs take up majority of her head. And you can kind of see her looking around, surveying the, the area around us. Um, she kind of locks her head in sometimes. And if she locks in on something. Oh, I'm trying to see if she'll lock in. I can move her body and her head will stay in one spot because uh, it's an adaptation these guys have. Um, so when they're hunting or they see something moving or a predator, they can always keep their eye on it and see, do I need to flee or is it time to hunt? Should I go and grab it? You're not going to focus. You're looking off too much into the distance. Um, but what makes these guys be able to see better than us at nighttime is a few things. One, their eye shape is very different. Your eyes are round like marbles. I didn't say your eyes. My eyes, too. Our eyes are round like marbles. So they, marbles roll around really well on the ground. Where owls' eyes are actually tube-shaped, like cylinders. It's like a straw. If you ever roll a straw on the ground, it doesn't really roll around as well as a marble. It kind of goes one direction or the other. Okay, so she does not have the ability to move her eyes, which is why you've noticed her turning her head around so much and talking a lot. You're talking back to me. <laughs> so she cannot actually turn her head all the way around, which some people believe owls can because of how far they do turn their head. Uh, but if she was able to turn her head all the way around, just keep spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning, her head would pop off and roll on the ground. Yeah, that would not be a good adaptation. Uh, that's because they need something attaching their head onto their body. So they have a neck, but their neck differs in our necks because they have twice as many bones in their neck. We have seven. That means she has 14, which gives it a lot more flexibility. So like a test to see how far you can turn your head. If you kept your shoulders square, okay, and you turned your head, then you can only go so far. And then if you want to keep looking, you kind of have to roll your eyes, right? You can only go about like 180 and then turn your eyes to the rest of the way. She can turn her head three quarters of the way around, so around 270 degrees, okay? So a lot farther than, than us, but she'll turn one direction, and if she wants to see uh, more with behind her, she'll turn back the other way. And she again, she needs that adaptation because of the type of her eyes she has, but she's also important for her to see what's behind her because she's a small owl and, and predators want to sneak up on them, all right? Uh, do we have any questions about Olivia before we put her away? I can talk forever about her, but I also want to show you guys some other animals. Any questions about so Olivia? You said make megascops can accord you. Make what? Megas make megascops can accord you. Can Not sure what that what that means. So. Oh, 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 talk about, oh, about a species. Oh, I don't know scientific names. I'm not really good. I think the, the only ones that I know uh, more are the, the, tit the Tito, the, the barn owl. Um, but I'm not good at Latin. I can't pronounce a lot. Of, oh, um, they also, oh, the Lucidium tact tactatum. Okay. Mm. That was another thing about their eyes that we didn't really talk about. <laughs> I try to, I like talking about it, but it's hard for me to pronounce it. So I apologize if I didn't pronounce it right. Nicotating tactatum. Nick Nick. Oh, yeah, I can't either Nick. Now. So <laughs> yeah. Um, so they do have um, a kind of a special lens in their eyes. Or Nick Tate, okay, I'm getting the two. The, the one's eyelid, and then there's a lucidum something. Again, you guys can research and find out these actual technical terms. So um, the, the eyelid is just a clear eyelid that, if you notice when she was blinking, she's able to keep her eyes open and blink and she can actually still see through it. So again, if she's focusing on something, she doesn't want to lose that focus, she can uh, moisten her eyes. The lucidum tictatum, the other one I can't pronounce, is actually um, um, in their eyes, and what that acts is, helps these guys see better at nighttime. So if you ever go outside at night and you're shining a flashlight around and you come across an a, a nocturnal animal and it looks like their eyes are glowing, 
their eyes aren't actually glowing, but it's that, um, that membrane that's actually reflecting that light back at you. It acts like a mirror. And this gives nocturnal animals better vision, uh, which owls, um, again, when being an animal that has some of the top vision at night, vision is very important for them. Um, these guys can see much better than us because their pupils can open and let a lot more light in, bounce off that, uh, that lens and create even more light. So people, some people think, you know, we, luckily we don't have nights where there's no light whatsoever. We have the moon, the stars, there's always light and unfortunately light pollution as well from man-made stuff, um, but there's always light. If for some reason light just disappeared, no light on this planet whatsoever, nobody would be able to see, not even the nocturnal animals. They need some light, they just can amplify it. All right, I'm gonna put Olivia back. We're gonna get our more challenged, uh, the character out next, more challenging. <laughs> Get back up on that perch. Then, uh, with the lighting that I have, they want me to zoom in on the bird. Oh, okay. So take some of the pressure off. All right, you guys. You guys don't want to see my face? <gasps> oh, I'm offended. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't blame you. Oh, oh, on the phone. All right. So. I'll get back on screen before I get her out. So I just want to give you guys a heads up. Uh, this next bird, she is uh, a little bit more high strung, not as easy going as um, Olivia was. And again, with the wind, she might be a little, uh, little more bouncier, but don't worry, she'll calm down pretty quickly. Uh, again, I just want to give you a heads up if you see her kind of uh, moving around. This next owl though, that I'm going to bring out to share with you guys today is the most common owl you will find in Santa Clara County. And her name, this will give you a hint what she is, her name is Barnadette. We just had Olivia, now let's meet Barnadette. If you have a guess, you could go ahead and type it in the comments. <laughs> they were also asking how old is Olivia. Oh, good question. So Olivia, when we got her, um, it's, she wasn't a baby. So uh, unless you get them as a baby, it's really hard to age them. They're not like mammals, like dogs or cats, where you can look at their teeth. Birds don't have teeth. Um, so we estimated she was young. Um, so we think we got her back in 2011, actually the same year we got this next bird that's coming out. Um, so yeah, I can't do math that fast, but yeah. So <laughs> one plus since 2011. All right. I'm, you guys can, you know, it's being that, you know, summertime for, for a lot of you guys too, if you're not in school and stuff, it keeps you up on your math, right? Cause this is what happens if you don't keep up on it, then you can't do it in your head really quick. Um, but this next bird is also similar age to her as well. How long do they live is usually the question I get right after that. Uh, the, uh, the smaller owls tend to have a shorter life expectancy versus the larger ones. Uh, Western screech owls are uh, around 15. Um, but again, that's just an average and they can live longer and in the wild they can even live shorter because again, they are such a small um, owl. Uh, they do get eaten by other animals as well. They have a lot of predators out there. All right, let's meet Barnadette now. All right. Let's behave. Come on. All right. I always like to warn you guys if an animal is going to be difficult because then usually they're, they're perfect. They like to make me a liar. Um, so. Hold on one second. Oh, sure. I pushed the wrong button and you got to see a close up of me and my mask. Okay, here we go. All right, so it's just on Barnadette now. I'll try to keep her, stay, stay keep right here so she doesn't uh, move out of the frame. <laughs> yeah, you can just kind of put that on there. So our, our covers, we have our a uh, animals, they transport in a kennel and we put a cover over them um, of the kennels to kind of keep them uh, nice and uh, relaxed. And with the wind here, they're kind of trying to blow away. Um, but yes, this is Barnadette. If you guessed barn owl, you are absolutely correct. Uh, now, this owl um, you might be familiar with because um, if you've ever gone outside at night, you've probably heard one. Now, they don't sound like a screech owl, which is named screech owl, but these guys do screech. Okay, so remember we heard Barnadette, no, Olivia making a trilling type of sound, but barn owls are actually the ones that screech. Okay, so again, it's very misleading. Um, if you have a palm tree around you, these guys love to live up in palm trees. Um, so again, at night, come out, take a look, you might see one or keep your ears open, you might hear uh, one scream. Um, actually at Coyote Valley here, we've asked you, actually rescued one here and got to release it back out into the wild. 
Um, so it's kind of cool to be bringing her back, bring another barn owl here because this is a perfect habitat for them. Um, the reason why it's such a good habitat is if you notice behind me is a big field. These guys love big open fields and you can tell her feather color is very different than Olivia's because unlike Olivia who blends in with trees, she actually blends in with these nice grassy fields. They're asking what are her predators, what would predate upon her? On, on uh, barn owls? Yes. So uh, these guys, um, again, are not top of the food chain. Other owls, such as great horned owls, will um, eat a barn owl. Uh, it's probably one of their biggest predators. And we're going to talk about um, these guys like to live, get in these big open fields where great horned owls and those screech owls tend to live where there's more trees so they can camouflage in. However, owls are kind of overlapping their territories because they're following their food sources. So uh, being a bird of prey, she does like to eat a lot of mice. She'll eat rats, she'll eat golfers. Oh, you're okay, Barnadette. There's a lot of squirrels right here. <laughs> <laughs> They'll eat squirrels. They're good for ground squirrels. Will she be okay if I move? Yeah. There you go. Sorry, I didn't mean to oh, you're fine. Try to get light. There we go. Give me a little bit better. It actually helps too because she always usually she sees her kennel. She's like, I want to go back to sleep. Remember, she is a nocturnal um, <laughs> animal. <laughs> you can't see your kennel, Bernadette. Um, but again, she would normally be out in big open fields where the great horned owls again would be in trees. However, um, their prey, the animals that these guys are hunting, um, are being attracted to where people are. Uh, we produce a lot of garbage, so we're attracting a lot of those mice, um, opossums, uh, skunks, uh, a lot of animals close to humans, those rats and mice. So instead of waiting out in the wild for the prey to come to these predators, these guys are following their food sources um, into more cities, okay? Um, so, but she does prefer, these barn owls do prefer to be in open spaces, but you'll find them in urban areas as well. Uh, Cause again, they're out there to find uh, their prey. And that gets those great horned owls, which are a predator and these guys territory to overlap. Um, so it's unfortunate for the barn owl, uh, but these guys um, are strong in numbers. They're, they're not at risk of um, going endangered. Um, in different parts of the world though, that's a different story. I know at one point in Canada, these guys were considered endangered species, uh, which is weird that different areas, you know, just depends on their numbers, um, how much they had versus, you know, the, the different changes. Oh, she was going, oh, let me fix you. There we go. Now, so I would say uh, great horned owls are probably one of the biggest natural predators. Oh, she tried to bite me. This is why you don't make oh. owls pets, right? She's been feisty this morning. And yeah. Angie was asking, she said, we didn't hear, um, why is she in captivity? That's actually what I was going to go into. I get ah. sidetracked very easily. Um, but you might have noticed when she's kind of uh, doing what we call baiting um, on my hand, you might notice, I think the wind's pushing her off a little bit. Um, you might notice that one wing looks different than the other. Um, the left wing is shorter. She actually was found in Gilroy on the ground, unable to fly. A homeowner saw her, um, ended up calling the police department who came out, uh, were able to catch her and contacted WRC. She came into us. It was quite obvious why she wasn't flying away. Um, her wing, she's missing her wrist on her left wing. Yes, birds do have wrists, so um, they have a very similar bone structure. Most people think the top of the wing, um, I can't point her without losing my finger, uh, but the top of the wing is their elbow. So their wings kind of sit up like this, but actually their wings sit so their wrist is on the top. Sorry, I know you're probably focusing on her. <laughs> I talk with my hands, so. Um, but yeah, so that's actually her, uh, her wrist and her elbow is down lower, so she's missing that top half of that wing. Um, now, it wasn't something that happened out in nature. It was a really clean, precise cut. Um, so it's, um, unfortunately, there is a practice called pinioning. Um, so uh, people, like if you ever been to the wild animal park, um, you see these exotic birds out in, uh, in open um, spaces, open, open areas, but you wonder why they're not flying out of the park. Uh, that's because a process called pinioning is done where they actually remove that wrist to prevent a bird from flying. Um, which is important for non-native birds not to get loose and get into our ecosystem. So zoos and stuff, sometimes I have to do that. 
Um, but with her, uh, we feel that somebody somehow got her, either found her as a youngster. These guys do unfortunately fall out of the nest a lot. People um, see them, some, some well-meaning people and some not so well-meaning people might find them on the ground um, and do their, you know, the, the person wants to try to help them and, and get them back out in the wild. Some people might want to try to keep them as a pet. These guys do not make good pets. Uh, I'm worried about the impact of the wind on the owl's sensitive face and ears. Uh, we're going to talk, talk, you guys are going to want me to skip ahead on all these ones. We're going to talk about some uh, really cool adaptations barn owls have, because as it sounds like you guys already might know, that these guys have really good hearing. In fact, out of all animals tested, the barn owl is number one. Um, but really quickly, I'll tell you that and I'll go back to her story. She's on her, she's on your glove because it makes it safer for her right now, right? Because of the wind. Yeah, so she's actually holding on uh, with her talons, holding on to, to, to my glove. Yeah, which is why I have a glove on to begin with, because that would not feel comfortable going through through my skin. Uh, so I have these special gloves that help prevent those tips from going in. So she, when this wind's kind of pushing her, she'll grab on a little bit tighter to kind of help keep her balance. Um, all right, I think I answered that one. Let's go back to her story because her story, you know, I feel it's kind of important. Um, so uh, we did look, um, reach out to the community, see if anybody had a permit to have a barn owl because you can't just have one as a pet. First of all, um, here in California, you have to have a, a special license in order to have a special reason. It can't be just because, hey, I think it would be a cool pet. Um, so even WRC, we have a permit in order to have her, and she doesn't belong to us. She belongs to everybody. Um, that's why she goes out to uh, programs uh, so the public uh, get, gets to see her. When we're not in a COVID time, you know, we go out to um, other events and people can come and meet her in person. Um, all right, Barnadette. Oh, just a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, she's like, I want to go hide somewhere. I should be sleeping. All right, so uh, we reached out again, didn't find anybody uh, who had permits. Uh, we did get one tip back that in Gilroy around Halloween time, uh, somebody was dressed as Harry Potter. And if you're familiar with Harry Potter in the series, there's a lots of owls. Hedgewig is the first one that comes to mind. Hedgewig was not a barn owl though. Hedgewig actually was a snowy owl, but we don't have snowy owls here in Santa Clara County. Uh, but someone dressed as Harry Potter, walked around, and they walked around with a live barn owl. So we don't know for sure, but Barnadette here could have been a Halloween prop. Um, and because of that, we don't know if the person realized she makes a horrible pet after all and just let her go or if she escaped. Um, but as you can imagine, she was just left out there. She would slowly uh, starve, uh, not being able to hunt. Uh, again, these guys do hunt a wide variety of food. We've kind of talked about a little bit about that, both rats, mice, uh, ground squirrels, a lot of uh, golfers. Again, golfers, these guys, you want them to have around. Um, usually I also get the question is like, well, how do we get these guys to stick around? Um, again, the, um, if you have a palm tree around, you probably get them in there. Um, also some people will put out, um, uh, barn owl boxes. So not all owls will use boxes, but barn owls are one that do. Uh, sometimes people will put these, they're usually on a tall pole, um, out in the middle of a field, an open area, um, in a habitat that barn owls, uh, live in. Uh, sometimes people put these nest box up and they expect a barn owl to move in right away. Fortunately, it could take years before a barn owl actually moves in. But once you get a pair that move in, they're going to come back year after year to raise their clutch, which is their eggs, but raise their babies in that box. They'll come back to that area. So they only use these boxes for uh, raising their young. They don't live in it year round. Um, so what's really cool about barn owls is these guys, when they lay their eggs, they lay their eggs days apart from each other. So when they hatch, they're all different sizes and they have quite a large clutch size. Um, five or six is not unheard of. Um, and I believe there's been even more uh, youngsters uh, found in, in a nest. Um, unfortunately, not all of them do survive. Again, barn owls are not top on the predatory list. Um, so uh, a lot of times other owls, like I guess I mentioned the great horned owl is a big predator to these guys. Um, can go in, in into a, um, and get the parents and then the babies don't get, aren't getting fed. Both the male and females do feed the young though. So if one, some, one parent gets, um, gets killed or, or injured, unable to take care of the young, the other one will take its place. If something happens to both, unfortunately that will be a big problem. Um, also raccoons are a very big predator to um, the barn owls. Um, a lot of people when they think of putting a barn owl box, their first instinct is to want to put it up in a tree. 
that is one of the worst places you can put it because that makes it easy access for a raccoon because they can climb right up, put their little paws in that, in that box and pull out those babies. Uh, that's why it's always recommended to put it up on at least an eight foot pole, preferably a metal pole because that makes it very slippery for predators like raccoons to climb up. Um, if it does happen to be a wooden pole, um, you kind of put a little apron around in the, at the, cent the middle of the pole uh, to make it more difficult for anything to climb up. But again, open spaces is better for, for barn owls. But the reason why they have their babies days apart is years where there's lots of food, plenty of food for these guys to eat. Um, there's going to be a lot of food to go around. All, all those babies are probably going to survive. On years, just a little bit longer, Bernadette. There we go. Oh no! I talked. This is a shortened program. Uh oh. Oh. So while you swap out? I'm gonna swap Barnett out. Sorry we didn't. <laughs> Sorry. <it's> like, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you, if you have more questions about her and everything, um, you can either uh, email uh, Terry or, or, oh, space, or email WRC. Uh, the best ed email would be education at WRC dash, uh, dash the minus sign, whatever that's called. <laughs> uh, do you want to take that? W, okay. WRC <laughs> dash? All right, education at wrc-ca.org. You can send your questions there, um, and that will get directly to me. Okay, let me put her back, and I'll hook the mic back on. Because I have one, another animal to share. So one of the questions that people had was, how, how do you go about getting permission to, like, be a falcon? Oh, okay. Like, that's what I'm, I'm thinking. You know, cause, like, sure. Um, what goes into being allowed to have one? I'm like, lot. which order? Okay. Go ahead and get her and then... I'll, I'll get the next bird out and I will tell you what you can do if you would like to become a falconer. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use this to get her out. We won't use these. And I'll put these under here so they don't fly away. All right. So I guess I can talk a little bit about falconing while I'm getting out. So falconry, when you start out, um, you are, can only have a red-tailed hawk or an American kestrel, which is a type of falcon. And I'll explain why. All right, come on, Luna. Okay. Step up. She's like, but it's windy. And we don't want to lose the newspaper. Okay. Yeah. The reason that I had moved before you guys was because um, of the lighting. So see how she's backlit right now? I can move. So, um, yeah, they're just worried about the wind. Yeah, the, the wind, luckily she's a bigger bird, so the wind doesn't um, kind of throw off balance as, as much. Um, if the wind was blowing so strong that her wings were being pulled open, that would be a big problem. And we'd have to find a better spot or put her back. Um, really quick about falconry. Falconry is a sport um, that uh, uses usually falcons, but um, all bird, types of birds of prey um, for hunting purposes. Um, it's an old sport. Um, to get involved with that, you have to find a falconry club near you. Um, you can't just be like, oh, I want to become a falconer and I'm going to go get a pet, you know, hawk or anything like that. Um, you join an apprenticeship. It takes, um, I think, believe two years um, minimum, and then you take a test. Um, so you're wor already working with the falcon for, falconer for two years. Um, you take a test, and then you can get approved to um, have your own falcon, but underneath uh, the permit of your, your mentor. I believe you can get them earlier as long as getting the mentor. They technically belong to the mentor, um, but you are the one that's working with them. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, a, a test. You also have to be inspected. You get yearly inspected uh, from Fish and Game. They come out, make sure the animal's being properly cared for, making sure they have appropriate equipment, uh, a nice big aviary, because you can't just have one sitting in a bird cage in your house. It doesn't work that way. Uh, luckily, there's laws that help make sure that these birds, even though they're being you know, kept in captivity, have the best life they possibly can. Um, so again, the best way to get into it is again, uh, find a falconry club near you. Um, you can Google online. Um, it will help you tell you what you need to study again for the, the written part of the test. Um, 
you have to be a falconer. I think 10 years it takes to become a master falconer. Um, so depending on your level determines what types of animals you can have and determines how many you can have. So master falconer is a top notch. Um, I know in order to have an owl, you have to be a little higher of the levels. Again, starting out, it's only an American kestrel or um, a red tail. I was gonna say red tail kite, red tail hawk. <laughs> um, but anyway, I know we're running out of time. I wanna tell you about Luna here. She is a great horned owl. She is the second, is it working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, she is the second most common owl we have around here. Um, this is the one that the barn owls are in trouble if they're sharing the same territory. This is the top predator, okay? These guys hunt, you know, pretty much tons of stuff and not very many things hunt these guys. The babies are the ones that are most vulnerable, again, due to those raccoons. Um, now, those are their natural, more natural predators. Of course, if one was sick or ill, um, again, there's a lot more predators that could catch them because they're not able to fly away or use their sharp talons. Um, so, you know, even a bobcat, a mountain lion, it's not normal for them to get it again. There usually has to be something wrong um, with the great horned owl. Probably one of their biggest causes, though, of, of death is actually rodenticide poisoning, uh, which is also true with the barn owls, most, a lot of the owls, a lot of the birds of prey, uh, because people get so fed up with a lot of these animals, just gophers, things like that, rats and mice, coming on their property, destroying their property. Um, so they want a quick, easy solution. So they, without thinking, just put poison out. Um, so, but what happens was those animals eat poison, get nice and weak, make it very easy for a predator to catch them. Animals tend to go after the weak, weak ones, which helps the strong ones, you know, reproduce and kind of pass the stronger genes on to, to better the gene pool, where the weak ones get picked off. So if they're weak, they're going to get eaten, and that poison is going to accumulate in these other, in these bigger prey, uh, predator animals. Mountain lions get it, bobcats, things like that, and a lot of these owls. Um, and Mark wants to know if she's cold right now. She is not cold. Uh, um, <laughs> she would actually prefer it being even cooler. Um, a lot of feathers. Yeah, all those feathers kind of kind of blowing up. Uh, they help, those feathers help regulate your temperature. So even if it's hot outside, it keeps cool air um, by their um, skin by their body. And on hot days, again, it keeps cooler air. Um, so kind of like uh, cool. what hair kind of does, kind of helps them. Uh, anyway, top predator. Again, I get uh, kind of mixed up. Uh, nickname for these guys are tiger tiger owls, um, just because one they're a top predator, and two they kind of almost have the stripes. Like Olivia, she blends in really well with tree bark. So again, she's going to be in areas preferably with a lot more oaks, um, lot more, more heavier, dense areas. However, you will find these in the middle of New York City. So you'll find them in cities um, because, again, following their food source. These guys not only eat those rats, mice, uh, gophers, things like that, their most favorite food are actually skunks. Now you wonder, <laughs> ew, skunks? Really? Those guys? Something stinky? Birds of prey don't have a good sense of smell, um, so these guys don't rely on that, so the skunk has no defense. Uh, so she's going to swoop down and grab that food um, with those sharp talons. Um, her, she is one of the, she has 3,000 pounds per square inch in those feet. That's how tight she can um, can um, can squeeze um, again to go and catch her prey. Um, I didn't really talk about her her injury either, um, but she has nothing wrong with her wings or her feet or anything like that. Uh, so she could fly and hunt. Her issue is her beak. I don't know if you noticed um, on her face, her beak is crooked. And you wonder, who cares, a bird with a crooked beak? They could survive out in the wild, right? Well, beaks are made out of the same material as your hair and fingernails. And I'm sure you guys get, you know, have to get a haircut, trim your nails. Maybe right now with COVID, your hair is getting a little bit longer than normal. Um, but it keeps growing. Uh, we have to get it, keep it cut. Uh, well, birds, by opening and closing their mouth, they wear that beak down. Being that her beak is crooked, she's not going to wear it down uh, appropriately. So over time, that beak is going to overgrow until she couldn't open her mouth anymore. Even though she has the ability to hunt with those talons, she would eventually wouldn't be able to actually swallow her food, which would be very bad, and she'd slowly starve. So at the Wildlife Center, we have to do what's called coping. We actually have to file her beak down for her to keep it at a... Uh, 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 shortness that she's able to still eat. She actually just got cope two days ago. Um, so again, that's again filing that beak down, trying to keep, make it keep it straight as possible. 
Um, but uh, because she can fly, and we talked about kind of Olivia's enclosure, how she can't fly, but we don't want her falling really far, so she's up higher off the ground. Luna's in a flight aviary, and she can fly actually fly around. Um, not only do these guys come out to programs like this, she's also a surrogate parent. Um, so Barnadette is also, we use her a lot for surrogate parent. Uh, Olivia, she, on occasion, we don't get, usually get as many baby screech owls, um, but when we get baby owls in, depending on the species, they will go to the appropriate parent uh, because we don't want those babies associating humans as, oh, these are, what, these are what's taking care of me, these are what's giving me food. Uh, when I get released back on the wild, the first thing I wanna do is go up to a human. That'd be really bad. So instead, we put them in with our uh, educational animals. So these guys kind of act like a surrogate parent. Um, they might not necessarily feed them or anything like that. We have to wait till they're eating on their own, but they will actually, Luna here likes to, to groom her babies. Um, she actually has a baby. We just had to take it out from her um, so it can go into our, our large flight aviary um, to be able to, again, develop muscles and kind of develop its hunting skills uh, so we can release it back out into the wild. Um, so it will be with us for a while. Uh, great horned owls do stay with the parent um, for a long period, uh, period of time versus like barn owls. We actually just released two barn owls two days ago. It was very busy this week. Um, so they go, they, they fledge and take off a lot sooner. Now, I'm pretty sure I'm over time. Uh, again, there's a lot more information that I did not go over. Again, if you can think of anything, any questions, or hopefully by uh, learning about these animals, knowing that they are around you, keep your eyes and ears open. She's gonna make that traditional hooting sound that most people associate owls with. Yeah, so if you hear that, that's gonna be this great horned owl. So I wanna thank you guys. I also wanna thank Open Space Authority for uh, having us come out here to sh make, uh, being allowed to share these animals with you guys. All right, and, so. uh, and don't forget to tell them that they can watch programs on your on your Facebook page too. Yeah, we do have some Facebook Lives. Uh, um, Open Space Authority had sponsored uh, programs for the month of June, so we have some programs up um, live on there. And every now and again, we're, we're putting little shorts up. Um, but yeah, you can check out our Facebook page, uh, WRC. Um, W dot e, uh, uh, I can't talk W dot E dot RC so if you don't put the dots in there um, or if you type in WRC click on the one with the dots in it because that will be us if not you'll get some I don't even know what you'll get <laughs> yeah all right so thank yeah thank and you so much. That yeah. Was awesome. thank you Terry again for being a great camera person <laughs> keeping you on your toes moving around thank you thank you we'll see you next time yeah bye guys